In today's video, we are going to see Dr. Jordan Peterson's views on Adolf Hitler. But before that, let's briefly introduce Hitler. Adolf Hitler, the Austrian-born German politician who was the dictator of Germany, rose to power as the leader of the Nazi party, becoming the chancellor in 1933. During his dictatorship, he initiated World War II in Europe by invading Poland in 1939. He was closely involved in military operations throughout the war and was central to the perpetration of the Holocaust, the genocide of about 6 million Jews and millions of other victims. Welcome to Jordan Peterson Insights, where we aim to provide the best of Professor Dr. Jordan Peterson's wisdom. Subscribe to this channel for the most thought-provoking content from one of the most extraordinary psychologist and philosopher alive, Professor Dr. Jordan Peterson. One of the things Hitler started, it's a very strange story in many ways, because Hitler was obsessed with order and cleanliness. He was a very orderly person, and um, he was very sensitive to disgust, you know, because you think, well, the Nazis were afraid of the Jews, you know, because they were other, and that's not right. What, what's more accurate is that the especially Hitler, he, 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 was, he was very sensitive to disgust. That's what it looks mm. like. And if you're disgusted by something, then you want to eradicate it. If you're afraid of something, you want to run away from it. If you're disgusted by it, you want to burn it to the damn ground. You want to mm. get rid of it. And his writings, like I read a book uh, called Hitler's Table Talk, which was his uh, spontaneous discussions during dinner time from 1939 to 1942. It's really another amazing book. And was just unbelievable how often Hitler referred to the people he was eradicating, you know, the Slavs and the Gypsies and the Jews and all the people he went after, as parasites and as rats and as insects and all of that. So they were kind of put into that category. So, and here's a horrifying part of that story. Like when Hitler first came to power, he put in a lot of public health initiatives. Um, including mass tuber tuberculosis screening, which actually turned out to be a good thing. And at the same time, he went on a beautify the factories campaign. And so he convinced the German factory owners and so forth to increase the levels of hygiene in the factories, to get rid of the rats and the mice, to plant flowers out front, you know, to make everything look neat and orderly. And the insecticide they used was Zyklon. Well, Zyklon, to, so to eradicate the rats and the insects. Zyklon, a slightly different formulation, was the gas that was used in the concentration camps. And so Hitler went from cleaning up the rats and the mice in the factories and the insects, and then he went into the mental hospitals and started cleaning up in there. And then, like, it just went broader and broader, again, sort of one step at a time. You know, and the Germans had plenty of reason to be resentful and, and hateful because, I mean, think about what they went through. We can't even imagine it. The, first of all, there was World War I, and so there was many men, like Hitler himself, who served in the trenches. And there's one story about Hitler. He, um, he won a medal for heroism in World War I, and uh, he was sitting around with a group of his buddies and went off to do something, God only knows what. And when he came back, they were all dead because a... a mine had, la uh, not a mine, I don't remember what's kind of, some kind of shell had landed in the middle sure. and killed them all. Mm -hmm. It's like, that changes you. Yeah. You know, and then afterwards there was all these brutalized men who'd come out of the trenches. I mean, you just can't imagine what it must have been like in the trenches, you know, especially if you're there for like a couple of years. You aren't the same person. Get out of there, you're unemployed, your country's in ruins. Then the hyperinflation hits and every single person in Germany who ever saved any money at all is flat bloody broke. And then there's a communist revolution brewing in Russia and it's like, it's hell. And the Nazis came along and said, well, not only are we going to restore order and greatness, but we're going to bloody well tell you whose fault this is. Yeah. It's like, and Hitler, I've studied him a lot trying to understand what happened. And Hitler was, Carl Jung called him the mouthpiece of the collective unconscious of the German people. So you imagine there's all this resentment and hatred brewing underneath the surface and all this, this chaos is there and the desire for order is like clamoring in everyone's minds. And Hitler comes along and he's, he's a very powerful emotional orator and he's watching the crowd and he listens. And when he says thing A, nothing happens. And when he says thing B, everybody roars. And so he takes note of that and it's not even conscious exactly, right? Because he's being molded by the crowd. And so they roar, and so we think, so that's a reinforcement, that's a reward. And so then he goes down that line a little bit farther, and they roar some more, and then he tries something else, and it's silent. He, he acts out the dark desire of the mob. Mm -hmm. So he becomes the embodiment of the dark desire of the mob. And that's partly, that's partly why he had the charisma, it's right, because there's this unconscious 
fantasy brewing in the back of everyone's minds. You see that to some degree now with Antifa, for example, and, and their proclivity towards violence. You know, if you ask, what well, just exactly what's going on there? Well, Hitler came to embody the desire of the German people for order and revenge. And he, he embodied that fully, you know, and, and you could say, so what happened was a collaboration between him and the people. It wasn't mm. Hitler turned everyone into sure. Nazis. Yeah. It's like, yeah. no. That's not how it worked. The other thing too is that, you know, people are not that brave. And everybody thinks, this is one of the things I teach in my Maps of Meaning class, you know, it's like, okay, you, you look at Nazi Germany in the 30s and you think, well, I'd be one of the heroes who rescued the Jews. It's like, statistically, that's very improbable. And one of the things I've learned in the last year with all this strange political, this strange situation that I've been in is how unlikely it is for people to speak up. They just won't. Even tenured professors who are tenured, they're protected. It's like the probability they'll, they'll pop their head up and say something that might make them identifiable is very, very low. But you, even when the stakes are low, people won't right, speak up, sure. eh? So here's what you should have done if you were a Nazi and you wanted to win the war. You should have enslaved the Jews and the gypsies and had them work, right? You had the, should have had them work for the benefit of the victory and then if you wanted to, you liquidate them afterwards. That's the logical thing to do if you want to win. And we assume that Hitler wanted to win. But that's not a very intelligent assumption. Why would you assume that? He wasn't exactly a good guy. So why should we assume that he was aiming at the good that he was promoting, even in his own terms, right? The glorious, everlasting Fourth, Third Reich, right? That'll rule for a thousand years and be a, a bastion of civilization and music, because that's the sort of thing he purported to be interested in. Well. So what do you do with the Jews and the gypsies? Well, round them up, fine. Enslave them, fine. You don't kill them. You certainly don't devote a substantial proportion of your war resources while you're losing to accelerate the rate at which the extermination is taking place. Because that's a bit counterproductive, unless what you're aiming at is the maximum possible mayhem in the shortest period of time. Well, so what happened as the Germans started to lose the war? Did Hitler lose faith in his own ability? No, he believed that the Germans had betrayed him with weakness, and so he was perfectly willing to ex accelerate the rate at which Germany was losing the war. And so when Hitler and his minions had the choice, here's the choice. You can suspend your unnecessary demolition of people, win the damn war, and then pick it up afterwards, or while you're losing, you can just accelerate the mayhem even though it's counterproductive. It's like, what'd they pick? Well, they picked to accelerate the mayhem. And so to me, there's an old psychoanalytic idea. I think this was derived by Jung. If you can't figure out what someone is doing or why, look at the outcome and infer the motivation. If it produces mayhem, perhaps it was aiming at mayhem. Now, you know, you have to use that dictum carefully. If someone's irritating you, you know, maybe it's because you're irritable and you should sort yourself out, but maybe it's because they're actually aiming at irritating you. And that's the actual motivation. So, perhaps not, but it's another tool in your analytical armament. So, and so you see, well, and this is the thing about warfare that's so interesting about, because you, you, can, you can attribute it to territoriality, you can attribute it to a war for resources, that's what the, I would say, wretchedly simple-minded economists presume. People fight over scarce resources. It's like, hey, we're a little bit more sophisticated than that. And first of all, what resources are you talking about? The bloody Inuit had nothing. They lived perfectly well. What did they have? Snow and seal blubber. You know, people can live in unbelievably deprived conditions. And so, the idea that there are natural resources that we fight over because there's a shortage of them is a pretty oversimplified view of human beings. It's like, well, why do people fight? Well, maybe they fight sometimes for good reasons, but very, very frequently they fight for bad reasons. And those bad reasons are personal as well as sociocultural and economic. You know, if you were a Nazi prison guard, for example, whatever pathologies you were carrying around in your destructive little soul, whatever element of Cain was deeply embedded in you, had the opportunity to be manifest fully at every moment of your waking existence, right? You had these people who were completely beholden to you, with no rights whatsoever, to whom you could do whatever your evil little heart determined think, well, maybe that was a motivation for putting them there to begin with. And all the cover story about, well, we're trying to build the Third Reich and we're trying to stabilize the state and we're trying to do all these good things. Maybe that's just a cover story for the real motivation, which is nothing but, but what? The construction of death camps that killed six million people. How about that? And the obliteration of 120 million people on the planet and the, and the, and the, and the leaving of Europe in ruins. 
Maybe that was the motivation. Or are we going to attribute to Hitler the highest possible motives? Say, no, it's an archetypal manifestation of Cain. Now, he's going to put up a front that says, well, I'm your savior. It's like, well, destructive people think that Cain is their savior. <laughs>